Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys about how we uh, Samurai the company, how we break IT devices, um, but also some of the things that we can do to make things uh, make things better, really. Um, so uh, first slide. It's thrown us all off because you put the intro slides in there, guys. Right. So yeah, Emil. Um, short story. Worked at university, Sheffield Hallam for ten years. A great time. Then uh, realised I was in a really good area. Decided to jump ship, create a company, and have loads of fun breaking stuff nowadays, which is good. Uh, we also get a lot, of, um, a lot of cool students from Sheffield Harlem who come work with us, which is really great. Um, so, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to have cats in the slides, you know, keep going. I'm on, I'm on at the last, I need to get some energy going. Uh, talk about some IoT devices, explain some of the things we find when testing, uh, and probably get ushered off for going off my time limit. But as I said, because I really need a toilet, maybe not, we'll see. So, <laughs> Rick. You guys have probably heard about Ring, Ring was in the news, <coughs> lots of things, lots of bad stuff, Amazon's bad, big companies are bad, Ring is bad. Um, interesting, I have a Ring, right? I have a Ring for the good reasons that actually IoT can be a positive thing. Got an IoT <coughs> device, a Ring, because of security concerns. Because uh, I live in a, I live in a classic you know, terraced house in Sheffield, where you've got a little, as I call it from Leeds, a ginnel down the middle, not a general. Um, and round the back, you've got all the houses and stuff, and that's a great place for people to come round and try and build with your houses. Um, so I've got a Ring device for that reason. Now, Ring got in the news because um, a news report was released that a, a family had a Ring device inside their house, um, and that Ring device was in their daughter's room. I think it was an eight year old daughter, and uh, what happened was the family who had the device had a username and password that had been leaked via another website. And then somebody came along, grabbed that username and password, tried it on the Ring account, and it gave somebody access to the Ring device in that girl's bedroom, which is quite dreadful and very, very scary. Um, and they were able to talk to the girl through the Ring device, which again is, is quite scary, it's quite horrible. Um, but the interesting thing about this story was it was you know, slamming Ring, slamming Amazon, slamming IoT devices. But there's a few different parties at fault here, I think. So there's three different things you can look at. The first one is Ring and Amazon. Well, what did Ring and Amazon do wrong? Well, a lot of people argue they didn't turn uh, multi-factor authentication on. It didn't provide an opportunity for the parents to get a text message when this malicious person tried to log on to the Ring device. Then you've got the other company that got hacked and had those details harvested, and you've even got the parents' as responsibility of using those accounts in different places. So I think in this case, all three parties could be blamed at different sort of levels. But the point being is IoT doesn't have to always be scary. It doesn't always have to be a bad thing. It can be a good thing. If we use it correctly, it can enhance your life. So here's an example of, of IoT being good. So um, I'm going to do, not a demo, but hopefully this will work. Um, click this link. So this is my house. I'm not my house. That's not my house. I don't have a Windows desktop. I mean, I might do. The missus thinks I do, but I don't. Um, so what I'm going to do is bring this across. And this was in March last year at my house. This is my ring device, and I hope the sound's working because it's quite interesting. What you'll see is it's 3 a.m., right? 3 a.m., and the last thing you want to see at the back of your house at 3 a.m. when you wake up is this. Chat there over the torch. That's a good look. And if you listen, I hope the mic's working, the speakers are working. It's not. But he goes to his mate and goes, ring doorbell, right? Then the other guy comes around and you see a hand. It's quite scary that. And the best thing though, the, the ring doorbell didn't scare them off initially because they obviously tried to rip it off the door. But when they wasn't able to rip it off the door, what he actually did was press the doorbell. And you can't hear it, it just goes ding dong. And then you see them run away. And the best thing is, they weren't trying to get my house, they were getting my neighbours. And the guy runs off. So it kind of prevented the crime. So here's a story of Ring being bad, camera in a house. Here's a story of, I would say, Ring being good. Kind of not how I envisaged it working. I kind of thought they'd see the Ring and run away. They tried to steal the Ring, ironically, but it kind of worked. So yeah, it's, um, I don't know. Take that as you want, but it's just showing that it can be interesting. Um, another point, which one of the chaps in the office pointed out was, these are my share links. When I shared it to people, really excited, and you know, my Ring did a good thing, even to the police. And um, those links uh, that was pointed out are still available now. So if you share something on Ring, um, potentially it could still be available. Um, us being geeks, we talk about the entropy, how many digits, you know, how, 
how, how long would it take somebody to go through all those numbers and find everybody's ring videos that have been shared? So, you know, good and bad. It'll take a while, but I'm sure if you put enough effort in, you probably find a few people's videos that have been shared. Um, so, is it really that bad? Uh, Mike had a better number. I've gone for 50 bazillion, gagillion, fulfillion devices. Um, but there's a lot of devices out there. And one of the reasons that IoT devices could be bad is because of the proliferation, right? And this is really down to how devices are shared. So, you create a device, whether that's a ring doorbell, which can be quite expensive, or a five pound IoT device, and once those devices get put out in the wild, they can stay in the wild for a long time. And if we don't do the right thing, if those devices are not secured or looked after, then those devices will become a problem because you're going to put out into the world lots of devices that will become orphaned, lack encryption, all the things that we've heard tonight that can be a problem for IoT. However, if we do it properly, and we put IoT devices out there that can be updated, can be managed, can be maintained, we have a different world. We can have dystopia or utopia. So what we look at is so the situation of you know, what can go wrong, what can go right. Now, a lot of you probably, some of you might have seen Shodan, as a great example of a way you can see how many Internet of Things devices are doing good or bad things. So this was two days ago. So Shogun, for anyone that doesn't know, is an IoT, not specifically IoT, it's a search engine. And what Shogun, the team at Shogun do, is they basically scan the entire Internet over and over again. Every single IP address, everything they can get their hands on. And then they make that indexable and searchable by me or you, for paying the sum normally of one dollar. Then, once you have that, you can put searches into it. You can put searches, like we've done here, port 554 has screenshot colon true, which basically shows me any IoT device, i.e. camera, that is running on that port and will allow me to connect. So I can go and look at cats in the country, roads, or somebody's fridge. I'm not sure what they're trying to do there. Someone's obviously made back snacking and someone wants to be made aware of it. <laughs> The idea is, is these devices have been released into the wild and they've not been secured. So in the dystopian future, this is the bad thing. This is when we put devices out there and me or somebody more malicious can go and search for them and do bad things to them. Other examples include searching for printers. So geeks of the room, port 515 is a common printer port and if you search Shodan, it will show you printers that are available. And again, in the world we're living in, printers could be maybe classed as an IoT device, but the point being that any device that connects to the internet, and IoT devices definitely want to connect to the internet, um, that are put out there and are insecured and left you know, to, to wander in the pastures as they want, might cause us problems, especially when bad people can search for them and turn on them and cause bad things. The last one being an eye kettle. So these people put their eye kettles available, Again, what's the worst you can do? I can, you know, bring their electricity bill up by two or three pounds. But the point being, these things exist, and if we don't look after them and we throw them out there, it can cause us problems. So hopefully that demonstrates how available these devices can be and the choice of securing them versus releasing them in the wild. Um, reason two, I'm going to say, is we have short memories. We as a collective universe, humans, we have short memories, we forget things. Um, there's a phrase that a friend of mine used to be told as a developer, if it compiles, ship it. We have deadlines to many developers in the room, yeah? Is that a common phrase you get told? I want to make some money, I want to sell the software, I don't care if it's not ready. Anyone who plays games, there's a lot of games that go out there and you buy DLC as a patch, it's not great, is it? So the idea is that if, 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 uh, if software is done like that, we get a problem if IoT devices are done like that if they are shipped out when they're not fully ready, when they're not fully secured. So here's some examples of testing that we've done uh, where we found problems. Now this is one of our chaps, Thomas, who refers to only be named as Thomas because he has this persona of wearing a hood and you know being a real hacker and stuff. Thomas or Black Wolf, actually part of his dissertation he did at Sheffield Hallam, he tested cloud pets back in 2017. And what he found was this cloud pet was, was in essence a teddy bear that you could give to your child and the, the child could interact with the cloud pet. Um, upon further sort of investigation, Thomas found that the cloud pet wasn't secured as well as it should be. In essence, that anyone who could connect to the cloud pet 
could interact with it. They could make the cloud pets lights go on and off, they could start recordings, they could make recordings to the cloud pet. Again, the problem here is all the vulnerabilities that Thomas found in this device had been vulnerabilities that had been around for maybe 5, 10, some 20 years. But what happened is market forces said, we want to get first to market, we're going to get a teddy bear, we're going to put some technology in it, and we're going to ship it, and we're going to sell it. And what it takes is people, good people, to look around, find these problems, and kind of call them out and say, look, we can be better, we can make this better, we can make this securely. Since then, I believe cloud pets have been removed from the market, which is kind of a positive, um, positive thing, because they, they shouldn't have gone out there. Um, we find a lot of things when we're testing, so we get, we get told to, uh, to test things um, that are IoT devices. We get told, we get asked, or we bid for now, hopefully we get them, and we test them. And Telnet, for anyone who doesn't know, is a very old technology that has been around, and people who are maybe a bit older than me, I'll say the 80s, probably even the 70s, it's an old technology that lacks encryption, so based on what Tom Michael is saying, encryption is really important, not having it is really bad. And when we get given these IoT devices and we test them, uh, one of the things we find is an issue that was created in the 1980s. So we're kind of like, when I say short memories, what I'm saying is that we're not you know, thinking about you know, problems of the 2020s, we're thinking about problems of the 1980s because it just works. So we see that a lot. Uh, we also, uh, this is my house, again, I don't know why I'm very proud of my house. Um, but this is me scanning two devices in my house. I have a TP-Link um, sort of, uh, you know, power over Ethernet device. You know, if you live in, a, in an old house that doesn't have Ethernet ports, you use the, the power cables. Um, I was just searching my own IT, IoT devices, and when I was scanning them, um, you can find a lot of ports open, a lot of services available, which may or may not, or should or should not, be available. And I couldn't show these. Uh, the, the ones I wanted to, which were devices we've tested because of NDAs, but the idea is that if you have access to IoT devices and you scan them with a tool called Nmap, you might find certain ports open. And what we're finding, on average, is a lot of the IoT devices we scan have more ports open than they should have. For anyone who's not familiar with ports, that's kind of doors and windows, yeah? So the more doors and windows a device has, the more opportunities there are for somebody to interact with it and cause problems. So a lot of IoT devices come with a lot more doors and windows open than they should do. And that's what one of the things that we're seeing a lot of. Um, here's an IoT device we tested a bit ago. And what we found is if we put the IoT device on our network, uh, we browsed to the URL backupdatabase.php, it gave us the backup database. We then downloaded the backup database and we opened the backup database and you know you get this idea of hackers being all like super complex and no, 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 no. <laughs> Very simple. And I've had to kind of sanitize this bit here, but this IoT device was recording temperatures and <coughs> things to do with elderly people who, you know, the IoT device was there as a sort of a bit medical monitoring, making sure they were okay. Not them themselves, it wasn't attached to them, it was in their house. Um, but in essence, we could get access to data that was probably quite sensitive, potentially medical in nature, which isn't great. And again, this kind of attack, or you know, uh, if you want to call it that, um, it's something that, you know, in the, in the 2000s or 1990s, people would be going, that's not very good. On a modern pen test, so if we take, we test, say, IoT devices on one hand, and we test brand new Amazon AWS instances, if we found that, on an Amazon Web Service test, which is more modern, I imagine that the CEO of that company or the Chief Information Security Officer wouldn't be very, very happy with their developers. However, in an IoT world, this is more common, it would seem. Uh, the other one, cross-site scripting. Uh, again, it's an old attack, it's been around for years. We still see it on websites, um, but what we might find is a website that is, I'll go over. It's not something that we don't need um, uh, it's an attack like this that we might see on a common website in a lot, very few places, but on an IoT device, um, only in a very few places. Lack of HTTPS, which Mike's mentioned. Um, available devices, and how effective they can be with more all security issues, but we invite them into our homes and offices. So, quick one is 
you have a very secure network, DMZ, firewall, lots of money spent, but you've got a wireless printer, and that wireless printer has been installed and connected to your network. So instead of spending a lot of time and going through your firewall and all your expensive uh, equipment, what we'll do is we'll have a quick Google and we'll find the HP wireless password is by default 1234578 and then we will log onto that printer, find a way to jump off that printer onto your network. So in essence, going around the uh, side door, so to speak, kind of a little bit better serial number. Um, what's all about that? Well, time, uh, cost models and cautions. Basically, if you get an IoT device, and you pay a little bit of money and no subscription, you're probably not going to get any support. Uh, this one, can't talk about that. Time for a plug though. Uh, we're going to do an event uh, shortly. Uh, we're going to event on the 11th of March, uh, a talk that's going to be free, and we're going to do a, an incident response game with Samurai, uh, which I'll spread out some details through different channels. Uh, it'll be at Hallam, should be lots of fun, should be good. Questions? Finished. Thank you. <laughs>